Let me, let me ask you kind of a big picture air power um, question. As, um, because, well, I, I, I suppose that's the key to innovation as well, right? Your, your, the willingness to, to fail. Um, and we have a lot of adversaries who are working very, very hard, having looked at all of our second offset advantages, uh, the proliferation of technology, mast fires, uh, the Chinese investment in long range uh, ballistic missiles of all stripe to push us as far away from, from their shores, electronic warfare. As you look at the air combat environment, say five, 10, 15 years from now, it's a two part question. What does air combat look like as somebody who's, you know, was a student of history, but also lived history in Vietnam and that conflict, the conflict since the Gulf War? As you look into the future, what does the future of air combat look like? And is, are the, is the American people, are, are Americans ready for the kind of losses that may be required? Is the Air Force ready? Are airmen ready? that in some future conflict, whether it's with the Chinese or anybody else, you may be closer to World War II kind of loss rates than anything that we've seen in the past 40, 50 years. <clears throat> I don't know how to answer that question, so let me answer a different question. Uh, I think people are more important than any other factor in, in the question you've just asked. When I took over as chief, uh, we had about 70 years experience in air combat. And only 50 of it had been as an independent air force. So, uh, you know, Human beings have been fighting on the ground since before there was a species. I mean, uh, monkeys pick up sticks and fight each other. And we've had naval battles going back to Marathon. Or, I mean, uh, so we've got millenniums of millennia of experience in ground combat and naval combat. Yeah. When I took over 70 years of experience in air fighting, and by the way, wasn't very good experience. We bombed the hell out of Germany and uh, killed a lot of civilians, and production in most German war materials increased right up till the end of the war, and lost air crews at a murderous rate. Can you imagine? 25 sortie limit and you get to go back to the States or it later increased to 35 missions and you could go home. And your odds weren't very good at getting to 35, by the way. We did more or less the same thing in Korea. We killed a million, maybe closer to two million, mostly civilians in bombing during the two years that we were stalemated along the 38th parallel, roughly, and ended up about where we started. Our experience in Vietnam wasn't very good either. Talk about MISTI. You know, we worked very hard on that problem of stopping traffic down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and never stopped it. Uh, a a one-lane dirt road, and we couldn't close it got to be kidding me. And so after Vietnam, there was a generation, and I was part of that, where we decided we're going to fix this thing, okay? We're going to start by figuring out how to penetrate defenses without losing a lot of people. Stealth came out of that. We're going to figure out how to operate at night uh, various infrared systems and other systems came out of that. We're going to figure out how to hit what we aim at. And all that has come to being. We saw the beginning of it in Desert Storm, but it's continued to roll out. We can now go anywhere we want in the world against any defenses, any time of day, and hit not the truck, 
but the hood ornament. Okay, so that's what we aim at now. And nobody wants to fight us, especially at night. I mean, uh, they're going to die at night. They're going to die in the daytime too, but at least they'll be awake and be able to see what kills them. No, no country with adult leadership wants to fight the U.S. Air Force anywhere, anytime. And that was done by people. That was created by, I mean, the, today's Air Force was created by people. And if you ask me what kind of combat we're going to have in 25 years or 30 years, the answer is I don't know. But as long as, I mean, the present chief's a pretty smart guy, near as I can figure. And as long as we can continue to have people like him running, leading the organization, we're going to be okay. Uh, there is an extraordinary picture of you, Ron Fogelman, and Butch Basilio, uh, and I want you to tell me about that picture, because uh, you and General Fogelman were both uh, misty, fast facts, uh, and as I recall at the time, General Basilio was a SPAD pilot, if, if I was correct. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, because I think it's extraordinary that two of you became chief of staff, all four of you became four-star generals. So it's a pretty extraordinary picture. So, so tell us about that. Well, in my book, Hangar Flying, Volume 1, there's a picture of Mike Dugan and I in the 79th Squadron at RAF Woodbridge. That picture was taken about 1960-61. We Both of you made chief? What? Both of you made chief. We were in B flight. There were eight guys in B flight because we had a nuclear alert, Victor Alert mission there, F-100s carrying a nuclear weapon center line. And uh, we sat by, by data rank, eight of us. I was number seven seat. Mike Dugan was number eight. So we'd known each other for a long time, and we did both become, I succeeded Mike as chief. Then in Vietnam, when I was in Misty, Fogelman was one of my guys. And the third person in that picture was not Butch Basilio, it was Bill Creech. So Bill Creech, uh, and I'm standing next to Creech in this picture, and Fogelman is standing next to me. And uh, that's, you know, the, the link between Dugan and me and Fogelman was 13, 14, 15 as Chief of Staff of the Air Force. And of course, Creech was uh, a legend. He brought a lot of people up, including in some ways me, but M Mike Dugan worked for him, Ron Fogelman worked for him, Larry Welch worked for him. Chuck Horner worked for him. I worked for him. Chuck Horner worked for him. Uh, you know, Creech sort of created the, the modern well, not modern, the, the 90s leadership of the Air Force came out of people who went to the Creech School of uh, Tactical Air Power down in Langley, Virginia. What, it's something that sparked in me, and I want to get your take on this. There's a big debate about uh, unmanned systems, autonomy, uh, and whether they would such systems would deploy weapons. And folks are talking about limitations, limitations on artificial intelligence, especially as it applies to warfighting. Um, throughout history, folks have tried to ban firearms, crossbows, and everything else. Do you think that that is a weapon, or those such systems should be banned? Or is that, do you think, in the natural progression of war that it will advance, and you will have systems that will have some form of autonomous weapons release at some point? I don't know. And but my concern is, uh, how do you defend against such weapons? I think we stand un, you know, naked. And we're building a long list of people who would like to get even with us as we speak. And if my problem was how to defend Washington, D.C. from drone attack, how to defend the White House, say, or Congress, or the Pentagon, from an attack that comes offshore here, you know, out of the Chesapeake Bay, by 
relatively cheap drone aircraft that are increasingly easy to acquire and, e and operate? The answer is, I don't know how we defend against that. We're motivating people to do that, and we don't have a defense against it. And if we start today, we won't have a defense for 10 years. So there's a long-term problem of how we defend ourselves against this, this threat. And uh, we better get working on it.